Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Time with the SL. We bless God for his goodness, his mercy, his kindness, and his love. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, King of glory, we adore you. We bless your name. We thank you, Lord. It is through your will that we are alive and we are healthy today. Our Lord and our God, Father, we thank you for your grace that has allowed us to converge together. You have promised where two or more are gathered in your name. Father, you have said that you will be there. Our Lord and our God, Father, as we cry on you this evening, we ask that you will answer us, Lord. Father, that you will speak to us that word that we are trusting you for. Father, we ask for you to make your blessings and your abundant grace available to us. Father, from the start of this meeting till we end, our Lord and our God, Father, we ask that you will glorify yourself and accept our prayers in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So our word today is titled, When You Meet God. When You Meet God. Amen. And our text is taken from Genesis 32, 22 to 30. Genesis, the 22, Genesis 32, 22 to 30. Anytime I have to read about um, Jacob, I actually love the story of Jacob. I love the story of Jacob, a man who was wiser than his own self. Amen. Amen. And I read, That night Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two female servants and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob left all his well, so Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak when the man saw he could not overpower him he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man then the man said let me go for it is daybreak but Jacob replied I will not let you go unless you bless me the man asked him what is your name Jacob he answered the man said your name will no longer be Jacob but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel saying, it is because I saw the Lord face to face and yet my life was spared. There is a great mystery to this life that we are living in, a great mystery. And I think as you grow older, it dawns on you that you must struggle if you are going to grow. You have to struggle if you're going to grow. So growth always means some kind of struggle or in one form or another. Look at it as children, you struggle to grow physically. Even when you want to grow teeth, there's a struggle. When you have children crying, they will say to you, a baby crying, the baby is teething. The teeth are trying to come out. There's a struggle. Children struggle to grow emotionally. They are balancing so many different emotions. It's always easier to gain weight than it is to lose weight. Struggle. Even studying is not much fun. Spiritually, we can't grow godly when you first want to. You can't. It just doesn't come naturally for you to grow godly it is a struggle called discipleship but you struggle to grow and our passage points out today in verse 28 it says to jacob your name will no longer be called jacob but israel because you have struggled with god and man and you have overcome it's very interesting and when people read that story they almost think it's a metaphorical story i don't think so I think it was actually a literal event. But don't go too much into the details. So we see 
Jacob appearing to be beating up on God's angel. I believe there must have been an angel of God and Jacob was afraid. So three principles we learn from Jacob's interaction with this angel. And I think it's something we need to keep in mind when we also meet God. Number one, come out clean. Be clean about who you are. Be clean about who you are. A lot of the time, we are forming who we are. We are not saying our real selves. We are not telling who we really are. You look at the life of Jacob, understand that God used Jacob, but Jacob was not perfect by any means. You and I will never be perfect. We realize that we won't be perfect. Jacob was actually that kind of person who goes behind you through a revolving door and will come out in front of you. If you shook Jacob's hand, make sure that you left with your complete five fingers. That's the kind of person Jacob was. He was a liar, a cheat, a con artist, a crook. From the womb, he was the younger of two twins, or younger of twins, sorry. And he was born holding his older brother's heel. The name Jacob literally means heel grabber, means deceiver. You know, when people give their children some names, they have to be so careful. I look at those two names, Jacob, and I look at the other name, Moses. Moses brought from the water. What kind of name is that? His twin Esau was older and he was born to inherit the double portion of the estate. Jacob swindled him, not once but twice. Genesis 25, he swindled him for a pot of stew. Genesis 27, he deceived his father on the deathbed and took the blessing. So Jacob always came out on top. And because he had done these things, Jacob had to leave town in a hurry. He literally fled for his life. He saw this beautiful woman. I'm just going to, so we can read it in our own spare time. Read about Jacob. But Jacob spied a beautiful woman called Rachel. But he did not realize that he had met his devious match in his uncle Laban, Rachel's father. And we see it in that same chapter, chapter 29 actually this time. If we see it in chapter 29 of Genesis, Laban said to, to Jacob, no problem, you can marry my daughter, work for seven years. But he did not know that he had met his match. Because Rachel had a sister who, which is not a politically correct term now, what they would have described as an ugly duckling, senior sister. She was like the consolation prize. And on the wedding night, after working seven hard years, he's surprised to find Leah is the one in the bed. And his father-in-law said, well, you have to marry the older sister first because the older one can't be left without a husband. So Jacob had to work seven more years for Rachel. And I guess he would have looked at it well. Buy one, get one free. A con artist would admire another con artist. So he went for it and worked another seven years for Rachel. And the Bible said, the 14 years went by so quickly anyway, just because he loved Rachel so much. And then at a point, Jacob and Laban, they went into cattle business. Jacob was really good at it. But then his father-in-law, being a con man, just like Jacob, after a while, Jacob was tired of his father-in-law's antics. And he wanted to move on. He wasn't even there by choice. It was condition that made him go there. And when he told his father-in-law that he wanted to leave, Laban said, why don't you wait one more year? <laughs> Jacob had had enough. And by the time his father-in-law had told him all sorts of things, you know, they agreed that they would divide the flock. Jacob said he would take the not-so-good sheep the spotted, speckled ones. But of course, one thing Labour didn't realize is that Jacob was a breeder. And Jacob knew 
that the strongest cattle are actually the ones that are speckled and spotted. Anyway, that's a story for another day. And we are told in Genesis 30, 42, that Jacob loaded up his two wives, children, everything they owned, slaves, plus the two women he married as slaves, the spotted cattle, and in the middle of the night, he ran away from his father-in-law. And of course, we also know that his wife, Rachel, stole something from her father. We also read Laban chasing Jacob. And of course, Jacob ends up running straight toward Esau, who he had not seen in the 20 years since he stole the inheritance. What are all the questions that Jacob is having to deal with? Will Esau try to kill him? And with that, Jacob says to himself, hmm, let me divide my family and my possessions. Let me divide my family, let me divide my possessions. So he arranges it first, animals, goods, rams, camels, bulls, etc. Put those ones in front. If the worst comes to the worst, we will give them to Esau first. Then the next, put my, put my maids. Then next one, put the wives. What he was trying to do was trying to soften Esau up. Jacob was somebody who lived by his wits. He wanted to get away with his life. He was always calculating. Are you a calculating person? Are you always calculating how to do things? Are you always calculating? Do you think that you've gone through life because you are just so smart? You're always one up on the next person. And it was at night that Jacob said all of this thing. And at a point he needed to cross the Jabbok River by himself. And he can't sleep, tries to sleep, and falls into a wrestling match. You see, everything that is going on is happening while Jacob is sleeping. Jacob didn't realize that he was battling an angel and himself. His life was passing before his very eyes, and it was not a pretty show. You and I, we have to face up to our past, face ourselves, look in the mirror and know ourselves for who we truly are. You see, when you realize, when you find that your life is out of control, you need to understand that perhaps at that time you are wrestling with God you are wrestling with God I ask you this question this evening is God wrestling with you today is God wrestling with you today are you resisting God is there something that you are withholding from God you see when we come to God, when we meet God, you have to come clean about who you are. You have to come clean about who you are. Because God already knows, and it's no news to God. And have that understanding that no matter what, who you are, God still loves you. That's number one, when we meet with God. Number two, you have to be able to call on God for help. Call on God for help. Jacob was wrestling with who he was. Jacob was wrestling with what he had done. And he was at his wit's end. This was like his longest night. The longest night in his life. Fear, isolation and loneliness. 
you and I need to admit that we need God. We cannot do anything on our own. Without agreeing that you need God, God can never show you what you can become. He can't. And you see, until that point, Jacob, as far as he was concerned, he had handled his life really well. He had taken care of everything. He did a big mess up when he was growing and he ran away from it and started life again and thought, well, you know, things are better. Every time he had a challenge, he tried to sort it out. What are the things that you know you really should have handed over to God that you are still struggling with today? Jacob had been such a schemer. His whole life was marked by getting into trouble and running away. He was running away again, this time from Laban. He didn't realize he was going to run into his brother, who he was running away from in the first place. Jacob knows everything is up. The jig is up now. He knows he needs God. He knows he needs God. And in this struggle, verse 26 tells us that Jacob panted, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob is praying out of desperation. I won't let you go unless you bless me. I won't let you go unless I am a new man. Unless I am a different person. Change me, God. Change me from who I am into who you want me to be. Jacob panted. What he is saying is, God, my whole life is on the line. Now I understand as I stand before you that I need your help. Have you told God that you need his help in that thing that is going through in your life right now? You've gone round and round and round in circles. And I tell you truly, there's nothing like a little stress to build up your prayer or spiritual life because sometimes it's good. After all, have you noticed that your prayer life becomes more intense when you're under stress? And one of the very best places to run to when you're in trouble is pray through for you. Are you one of those people who says, well, God didn't work. God didn't work this time. Let me find something as an alternative to do. Do you have a backup plan? Just in case God doesn't come through. Is that what you are thinking now? If God doesn't sort this out for me, what else can can I do? What else can I do? And I tell you, if you have that at the back of your mind, then that is not trusting God. That is not trusting God. That is living in self-sufficiency and that was what Jacob did. That is the life that Jacob lived. He was being self-sufficient, believing in himself, believing that he, he could sort out his problems by himself. Until Jacob recognized who he was, who he really was. You need to know that truly you and I, we are limited and we are weak. And then when you realize that you can call out to God and see things that only God can do for you. I have learned that you cannot wrestle with God over your demands. It is better for you to know the heart of the one who you are seeking to bless you. Ask him to call you to that higher purpose in life. Ask him to help you understand how to be utterly dependent on him. Amen. Thirdly, what do we do? Thirdly, you then begin to commit yourself to do what God wants to do in your life. What is it that God is saying that I should do? What is it that God is saying that I should do? At the end of the day, Jacob is forced to come to the end of himself. Jacob is, cost, is, 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 is forced to throw himself exclusively upon God. And this story, the story of Jacob and the, the wrestling match, is about coming to the end of yourself so that God is finally free to work through you. 
I won't stop until you bless me. I throw myself on your mercy. That is what Jacob is saying to God. Jacob was conquered by dependency. And God wrestles with us in order to help us grow. God wrestles with us to encourage us by his presence to become better people. God is personally interested in each one of us. He wants us to realize our God-sized dreams, not these chicken dreams that a lot of people have. He wants you to think, look like an eagle, not like a fowl on the ground pecking around for corn. So from time to time, God is going to make a personal appearance in your life to assist in that process. But it's not always easy. It is not easy. It's God who struck Jacob's hip, knocked it out of joint at the socket, verse 25. Many translations say the man touched Jacob in the hip. Actually, what we read is that Jacob's hip was dislocated. Jacob could not emerge unscarred. And I read something about a paraplegic who was confined to a wheelchair. He wrote, he wrote this. This is so beautiful. Joni Erickson Tada. He said, remember he's a paraplegic. So he, he held the pen with his teeth. And what this is um, in her teeth. And this is, what, this is what she wrote. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man. When God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part. When he yearns with all his heart to build so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed. Then watch his methods, watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects. How he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into shapes and forms of clay which only God can understand. While man's tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands, yet God bends but never breaks when, God, when man's good he undertakes. How he uses whom he chooses and with mighty power infuses him with every act, induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he is about. Amen. So what do we understand from this? That it is impossible for you to meet God and remain the same. Something will happen to you. He will knock some joints out of place. And we see that Jacob was a different man after meeting God. He was not a perfect man after meeting God. But he was different. He came to know who his God was. Jacob became the leader that God always wanted him to be. Jacob had a real lasting change in his character. Jacob's battle and our battle is between life in the flesh and life in the spirit. That lonely and fearful night, Jacob changed from a man who got through life by scheming and conniving to somebody who would succeed through the power of his relationship with God something we all need to look at god wishes to do great things through us great things through your life but it's only in the surrender to god that you and i can find victory from this day on jacob no longer thought only of himself he then realized that he had others he had a brother that he ought to love he had a father a mother he had siblings or, 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 or he had, sorry, he had children. He had, he had children. He had wives that he needed to take care of. He needed to think about them. Now he consciously lived under God's will. And so asked himself, what does God want with me? Now, you ask me, SL, is this the only place for any of us to live? Yes. Yes. If you have to. If you want your name no longer to be Jacob but Israel. Because that is what it says. Because you have struggled with God and man and have overcome. You have to come clean. Jacob had to come clean. He was battling with an angel. You have to call on God. So you and I have to admit. So that God can show us. Jacob panted, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Verse 26. Let me tell you, there's nothing we can build on other than God. You and I, we have no backup plan. Our backup plan is what we are building on. That is God. Because God will come through. That is it. God will come through. Thirdly, you have to commit yourself. Commit yourself. God wrestles with us. 
It was God who struck Jacob's hip and knocked it out of the joint at the socket. Verse 25. Jacob couldn't do anything after that. He was changed by God. Jacob's battle and our battle is between life and life. Let us begin to thank God. Let us thank God. Even as we say to him, Holy God, we bow before you and we are all struck by who you are. You are light and you are life. You are grace, you are mercy, you are just, you are right. And you are filled with love and power. We are asking for your hearts to merge with our heart. Even as we merge, as we draw our hearts to you this evening. Father, we are seeking you with all our hearts. Because we know that our desires are found and our desires are fulfilled in you. We want to know you, Lord. We desire a relationship and so we say yes, yes, Lord. We ask you to reveal yourself to us today as we seek your face. Without you, our becoming loses its fire and our doing loses its purpose. We ask you to guide our steps and our hearts ever closer to you. Father, help us to know your voice and respond when you call. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this time in your presence. Father, we thank you. And as we depart from this study session, Father, we ask that you continue to speak to us, continue to encourage us, encourage our hearts, teach us to walk in your precepts, and let our fellowship be more than just a gathering. Let it be a blessing. We bless you, Lord, for we have prayed in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. Um, apologies for starting late, but we thank God we've been able to have this ministration this evening. I look forward to as many who are going to participate in our 5 a.m. declarations tomorrow morning. We thank God for his goodness, his mercy, his kindness, and his love. Tomorrow morning we are speaking our hope. We are speaking our hope. God bless you. God bless you. Remain lifted in his presence. Amen.